New Jerusalem, look at it as God's headquarters for his kingdom. Look at it as where God will reign, his headquarters. And it's from there that he will reign his entire kingdom throughout the universe. Well, we all like a good story, don't we? I, mean, I want you to think for a minute about some of the best stories that you've heard, or some, maybe some of the best endings of stories that you've heard. Because whether you like reading, or whether you like theater, or whether you like movies, we all love a good story. And this past week, as I was finalizing the prep for this message, I ran across uh, probably something I learned in high school, probably as a freshman that I promptly forgot, but it's this. Every story has five basic elements, every one of them. And every story begins with an exposition. It begins with the setting the stage and laying out the, introducing the character, laying out the conflict, introducing what's, what conflict is gonna be in the story. And then there's this rising action all to reach a climax. And then you've got the falling action back down to a resolution or a conclusion at the end. Every story follows that general, every good story, follows that general pattern. It has those five elements in it. And almost universally, we all love when the hero in the end wins. Or when the hero, it circles back around and you've got the conflict and in the end, the hero is the hero. And the hero uh, survives and does well. Almost universally, we like it. Now, sometimes you hear, well, that was too predictable or, or whatever. But generally, we all like that. And we like, understand, and realize that, that stories are cyclical. We like it when they come full circle. Well, today, we've come to kind of a long journey in this past year that our church has taken. You see, we've been reading uh, the, the One Story Bible Reading Plan. And our weekend series have been following along with that Bible reading plan. And as we've read the Bible, we've seen way back at the beginning in the book of Genesis, if you'll remember, it started with God in a paradise that we called the Garden of Eden. It started with God's creation, Adam and Eve, and there was a tree of life. Then when we get to the book of Revelation, which is where we're gonna be today, so we're, we're teaching from today, we see a very similar thing. You see, we see God in a paradise. We see God with his creation and there's a tree of life there. You see, it's come full cycle. The Bible is cyclical. And we've seen every one of these elements of a good story time and time again. We've seen the exposition, we've seen the, the rising action, the climate, the falling action, the resolution over and over and over again. We've seen it in uh, the story of Joseph. We, we saw it in the story of Noah. We saw it in the story of David and Daniel. We saw it in the story of Jesus while he was here on the earth. Over and over again, throughout our reading and throughout the Bible, we've seen the same thing play out, just like we just observed that we see the entire thing play out in the Bible overall, because the Bible in the end is God's story, the story of Jesus, the one story of him. Now, if you've been in, in, on this journey with us of reading the Bible uh, in the one story plan, congratulations. We are, we are coming to the end of the reading plan. And uh, today we're talking about the book of Revelation. This next week, we're gonna be reading in the book of Acts. If you're reading along, alongside, great job. Maybe you've gotten off track, get back on track. Go back to one, uh, visitgracechurch.com slash one story. Check out where we're reading, get back on. If you're reading another plan, congratulations. We are nearing the end. Let's finish strong on this reading. And today we are wrapping up our final series in the One Story uh, series this year. And it's called The End of His Story. We kicked it off last week in Revelation chapter 19 and 20. And we talked in that, uh, in that message th about the fact that Jesus is coming back. You see, the end of his story says that Jesus is coming back. Today, we're gonna to be in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And we're gonna learn and discuss the fact that the end of his story means that Jesus is coming, Jesus' kingdom is also coming. You see, not only is Jesus coming back, but he's bringing his kingdom with him when he does come. Now, our hope and our goal for today is that we 
we, we leave having a greater understanding of God's promises for this future kingdom. You see, the kingdom's coming. He's coming back. He's bringing the kingdom with him. And we want to understand more, uh, more in depth about the promises that he makes for this kingdom. So let's pray and we'll jump in to see what, we, what the Lord has for us today. Father, we, uh, we praise you for who you are. Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. Thank you for this book. Thank you for the impact that it has in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would, uh, that you would speak to us today. Lord, I pray that you would speak to every individual listening to these words. Lord, would you guide my words so that I, I say exactly what it is you want. So that my lips are yours, they're used by you, they glorify and honor you. Lord, we lift all of this to you in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, so the first thing that we're gonna see about the end of his story today is that Jesus promises to make all things new. Jesus promises to make all things new. Now, you might say, well, I thought we were talking about his kingdom. Yeah, we are talking about his kingdom. And he promises to make all things new in the context of that kingdom. Let's pick up our story in Revelation 21, verse one. He says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Well, the, the earth as we know it is gone. John's writing. He said, the first heaven and the first earth, they're gone. And then it's crazy because that last phrase, he just kind of throws in there. Also, there was no more sea. It's like the sea is gone. Verse, tw verse two, he said, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So John looks out and he sees this city coming down. He calls it New Jerusalem. Now that term New Jerusalem is only mentioned twice in our, in our uh, Bible, once here, once in Revelation 3. But jo John is going to describe this New Jerusalem throughout the rest of chapter 21. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. But he, he gets the initial glimpse of it and he says, it's adorned like a bride is adorned for her husband. I mean, think about the last time you saw a bride getting ready to walk down the aisle. You know, this past summer, my, my oldest son got married. And when his bride came around the corner and he saw her, he was just, just giddy. <laughs> just, his reaction was amazing because every bride is adorned for her, for her, for her husband. That's exactly what John says this this uh, new Jerusalem looked like. Pick it up in verse three. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. God himself is coming down in this, in this new Jerusalem. Verse four, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Now, this verse or this idea may be familiar to you. You may have heard it before. This idea that one of these days, every tear will be wiped from our eyes. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more hurt. There will be no more emotional hurt. There will be no more pain, no more physical pain. These knees are not gonna hurt anymore or whatever, whatever your ailment is. One of these days, John says, God, God says, I'm gonna wipe every tear away. No more sorrow. All the former things have passed away. Verse five, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. That's a promise. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. Then Jesus goes on, he says, John, I want you to write this down. I want you to write down that I'm gonna make all things new. And then by the way, I want you to write down what you're about to see. You see, Jesus promises to make all things new. Now, we like new things, don't we? <laughs> Do you like new things? I, I, most of us like new things, whether it's a new car or new shoes or clothes or, or how, whatever it is, whatever your thing is, most of us like those to be new. Now, there are those things that need, require aging and need, need to be aged in order to be good. Yeah, all that's true. But the, but the reality is we like new things. But what does it mean to make something new? What does that mean? 
Because that's exactly what John's saying. It's exactly what Jesus said. He said, I promise to make all things new. Well, think for a minute about the example of like a home remodel. It, in a home remodel, someone has to have a vision of what could be, don't they? Somebody has to, to draw up the plans and think about it, dream about what it'll look like. Then demo, demolition day arrives, doesn't it? Now, it, it, do you watch DIY shows? Have you ever seen those DIY shows where it seems like everybody loves demolition day? Everybody loves to destroy things. But demolition day is the start of the process of making something new. You see, what's there has to be de demolished. What's there has to be taken away. What's there has to be removed. Because in order to make something new, the old must pass away, which is exactly what John starts with in chapter 21. It says the earth, the way we knew it, and the heavens, the way we knew it, are passed away. And Jesus said, I'm making something new. You see, not only does God promise to make something new after the earth passes away, like we're talking about, something new for eternity, but you know what? He also promises to make all things new in your life and in my life. He promises to make all things new in our life. In fact, it's what the apostle Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Now, this isn't gonna be on your screen. Write the reference down, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, he makes everything new. The Bible says we become a new creature, a brand new being. We get a new heart. We, we, get, we get new peace. We get we get a new perspective on who he is. We get a new perspective on life. And maybe most importantly, we get a new eternity. We get a new eternity. No longer are we, are we looking at, at, at an eternity without Jesus in, in hell, but we're looking at an eternity with Jesus in heaven. You see, when we accept him as our savior, it says we become a new creature. He makes all things new in our lives and changes us so that we're different. But you know what I also think? He changes and wants to change things in our life right now, our everyday life. You see, there are relationships in our lives right now that he wants to make new. There are attitudes in our life that he wants to make new. There, there are marriages that maybe he wants to make new in our lives. You see, the fact is that God takes dead things in our lives, things that have been demolished, and he makes them new. That can happen every day in our lives. And sometimes that demolition is painful. Sometimes it's difficult when those things have to be removed out of our lives because God's making something new in that place. You see, the fact is God promises to make new things. And he also promises to make new things in our lives. Now, we're getting ready to go into the rest of chapter 21. And we're gonna hear and hear John's description of this new thing that God's created. John's description of new Jerusalem. And so as we get there, think for a minute, how do you explain something new to someone? <laughs> think, about, think about that for a minute. How do you explain something new to someone who's not seen that thing? For instance, if you've been to the Grand Canyon, have you tried to explain the Grand Canyon, what it looks like, how magnificent it is, how big it is, all of those things to someone who hasn't seen it? And, and sometimes in those descriptions, what is a comment that often gets stated? Oh, I just can't do it justice. Oh, I, you just need to see it. Well, John's getting ready to attempt to explain something that we've never seen. He's getting ready to attempt to explain something brand new. Uh, another example is, have you ever tried to explain, imagine explaining a new color to somebody or imagine explaining color to someone who's never seen before? It's very, very difficult. That's what John is attempting to do right here. He's ex attempting to explain New Jerusalem. Now, as we go into this description of New Jerusalem, a couple of things. Number one, I want you to get in your mind, what is New Jerusalem in the context of eternity? 
in the context of God's kingdom, New Jerusalem, look at it as God's headquarters for his kingdom. Look at it as where God will reign, his headquarters. And it's from there that he will reign the enti- his entire kingdom throughout the universe. Isaiah chapter nine, verses seven and eight says, the, the increase of his government, there will be no end. It will continue to increase and expand. This is the place from which he will reign. This is the place from which he will have his headquarters. All right, so now hang with me. We're gonna dig into this new Jerusalem description and see what it is that John saw. Let's pick up our story in verse 10 of Revelation 21. It says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. So John's led up by this angel to this high mountain and he sees the city coming down out of heaven, coming, just coming down, descending down, kind of floating down in, into, into, uh, into, into the, the atmosphere. Now remember, an angel is showing him this scene and we get to verse nine and he says, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. So he says to John, okay, I'm gonna show you the, the bride. Now, some wonder if the bride that's being referenced here is New Jerusalem. Well, I don't believe that it is because Revelation 19 says that the bride is the church of Christ is the bride of, of Jesus. But it makes sense that, that this, this, this uh, the city is adorned like a bride. That's what he says in 21 verse 2. Revelation 21, 2 says the city is adorned just like a bride. You see, a city that, in, that, that, that is inhabited by a bride should be adorned in the same way. And, I, and, and that's what John's talking about, that New Jerusalem is the city and it's adorned in an amazing way. Let's talk about how it's adorned. What's it look like? Well, there are very high walls around this city. In fact, the walls are 216 feet tall. I mean, imagine that, 216 feet in the air. They're made of jasper, solid jasper. There are 12 gates around those walls, three gates on each side. And on each of those gates are names that are written. And each gate, get this, each gate is made from a single pearl. They're carved out of a single pearl. Can you imagine the size of those pearls to carve a gate out of it? You've heard the term pearly gates, right? This is it, the pearly gates. That's what's happening here. There are 12 foundations on this this city, layered one after another. And every foundation has the name of an apostle written on it. And every foundation is covered by jewels. So you're getting it? 216 foot walls, 12, 12 gates, 12 foundations that, are, that it's sitting on. And this angel is holding this golden reed. And John says, he's gonna measure this city. And the dimensions, it's a square, okay? Now the city is 12,000 furlongs. Okay, what in the world's a furlong? A furlong is about 200 yards, which is about two, the length of two football fields. And he says, the city measures 12,000 furlongs, which get this, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Now to put that in perspective, draw a line down the middle of the United States. Half of the US is about 1,500 miles. So this city covers half of the United States if it was sitting right down on top of the United States. And then it goes up into the air 1,500 miles as well. This thing, is massive. Now, some believe that that, uh, that the city is a cube. Other people believe that it goes up into a pyramid. I tend to, to, to believe that it's a, it's a pyramid, mostly because there are references to Mount Zion and Mount Zion, what's a mountain do? A mountain comes to a point, doesn't it? And so whether it does, or whether it's a cube or whether it's a pyramid, it doesn't really impact what John is describing here other than the detail of what it looks like, all right? Then in verse 18, we get a glimpse, uh, another perspective of it. It says, the city was pure gold, pure gold, like clear glass. The streets were transparent like glass. You may have heard that description as well. 
of New Jerusalem. And then in verse 22, it says that there was no temple in the city. There was no temple. Now, remember back in chapter 21, right at the very beginning of the message, we read 21.3, and it said the tabernacle that was coming down, the tabernacle came down. You see, the, the reason there's no temple is because God himself is the tabernacle. God is the one. And that's what he's saying here. There's not gonna be any, any moon. There's not gonna be any sun. There's no need for light because the lamb is the light. The lamb is where worship happens. And then he says, the gates are never shut. But the only people that can enter the gates, the only people that can enter the city are those whose names are written in the lamb's book of life. Those are the only ones. So then we shift into chapter 22 and, and John starts off by talking about the throne of God there. And he talks about this river that's clear as crystal. So imagine the clearest brook, the clearest spring you've ever seen. This is more clear than that. He says this, this river is flowing out of, the, out of the throne. And then he starts describing this tree, the tree of life. And he says the tree of life is in the middle of the street and the tree of life is on either side of this river. It, so it's, it's like all over the place. Then he says there are 12 fruits that are produced and each tree yields its fruit every month. So there's 12 and the leaves of this tree is used to heal the nations. Now, I'm not sure if it's one tree. Clearly it sounds like there's 12 trees because there's 12 fruits. And also do the trees connect in some way? We're not given that detail. It's called the tree of life. And it says there's 12 fruits and it's all connected and there's different places throughout New Jerusalem that it's located. <sighs> How you doing? You hanging with me? There's a lot there, isn't there? There was a lot in that description and we just covered a lot of ground really quickly. Here's the point. Jesus promises to make all things new. And John has just spent most of, the, most of this chapter describing new Jerusalem, the new thing that Jesus created because Jesus promises that he's going to make all things new. This is where God will reign for eternity. It's magnificent, it's powerful, and there's so much that we don't understand, but we just have to trust what he says. Trust what, what he says, trust that it's coming, and then understand as best we can. You know, the same thing applies to our lives today, doesn't it? You see, Jesus promises to make things new in our lives today. Sometimes we don't understand necessarily what he's doing. Sometimes he's doing things in our lives. He's shaping us. He's making us new. He's making something new in our lives. And that requires demolition sometimes. It requires sometimes pain. And we may not understand it. And we may not understand ultimately what it will look like or ultimately what he will do. But we have to trust him. And we have to follow him and we have to believe him. So not only does Jesus promise that he will make things new, but the second thing that we can learn is at the end of his story, Jesus promises that he's coming quickly. Jesus promises that he's coming quickly. Now we learned last week that Jesus is coming. In, in, this, in, in chapter 22, three times in 13 verses, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. Let's look at him. Verse seven, behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Verse 12, behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And then verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. Three times he says, I'm coming quickly. You might say quickly. We've been talking about this for 2000 years. <laughs> this isn't very quick. It doesn't feel very quick at all. <laughs> but I want you to do something. Think in terms of eternity. It changes our shift, it, it, our perspective. It shifts our perspective of what we're thinking about, of what it looks like. Also, quickly doesn't necessarily only mean length of time. Quickly can be sudden. Quickly could be like, oh, that suddenly happened or that happened quickly. So have you ever had time get away from you? Have you ever had... You're, you're thinking, oh, I gotta, get to, I gotta get someplace at a certain time and then time gets away from you. It happens to me invariably in the mornings. I'll wake up, maybe I'll get up an hour early and I'm thinking, oh, I'm doing great this morning. 
this is awesome. I'm gonna be on time. And then you know what happens? I start thinking about all the things I could do. <laughs> I start, I'll, I'll do this, I'll say, oh, I, get, I gotta get this. Uh, I need to take care of that. I can do this. I can do all these things. And pretty soon, you know what happens? I'm late. Time just got away from me. What in the world am I doing? That same thing can happen to us. And I think sometimes when it comes to Jesus' coming, time can get away from us. You see, we start doing things that aren't bad. The things I do in the mornings, oh, those aren't bad. They're productive things, usually things that need to get done. But you know what they're not? They're not helping me get where I need to be on time. And sometimes in our lives, we lose track of time. We, we lose track of, of time and we realize suddenly, oh my goodness, Jesus is coming. And one of these days, he's gonna be here. And it's, in, it's important that we not find ourselves doing all the other things that are good things, but that don't count toward eternity. And it's keeping our mind focused on him and on eternity and where he wants us to go and where he wants us to be. So the end of his story shows us that Jesus promises to make all things new. The end of his story shows us that Jesus promises that he's coming quickly. And there's one more thing that we can learn about the end of his story. You see, the end of his story shows us that Jesus deserves our worship. Jesus deserves our worship. Look at John's response in Revelation 22, verse eight, is what he says. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Verse nine, then he said to me, see that you do not do that for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. And then he just makes this declaration, worship God. You see, why did John worship the angel? Because he was in awe of all that he had just seen. Angels are magnificent and they're powerful. And John is just undone and he falls before him and worships him and he says, whoa, 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 get up. Don't worship me. You see, sometimes we worship the things that are in front of us, don't we? Sometimes God does something and we, we just worship and we don't necessarily worship him. We worship the thing he just did. We worship the person that's in front of us. Not bad people. Maybe it's our kids or our spouse or you fill in the blank. When our response should just be worship God. You see, the end of his story compels us to worship God because he deserves it. Listen to Revelation 4 verse 11. He says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. God is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of your worship. He's more worthy than anything that we can see. He's more worthy of our worship than anything in this life. Anything. You know, worshiping God means we realize that He's worthy. It means we offer him praise. We offer him honor. It means we submit to him. We yield to him. We listen to him. We adore him. We love him. It means we think about him. It means we do things for him, things that will please him. See, the end of his story shows us that he promises to make all things new in our lives. He promises to make all things new for eternity. That's true for eternity, and it's true for your life and my life. Is he making things new in your life? What's he trying to change in you to make new? An attitude, an action, a thought, whatever. He also promises that he's coming quickly. It's important that we not get caught doing the things that are not important for eternity. I'm not talking about going, uh, going off the deep end and not doing the things that we need to be doing or being responsible. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about keeping our eyes focused on Him, keeping our mind on Him, because He's coming quickly. He's gonna be here. And then are we spending time worshiping Jesus? Are we spending time worshiping Jesus? If you know Him as your Savior, 
Are you looking for his return? Are you worshiping him? And maybe you're here and listening to this, this message and you don't know Jesus as your, as your savior. Your first step in worshiping him is to accept him as your Lord and savior. To come to that realization that you cannot do anything to get to heaven. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died for you, that he took your penalty. You accept that gift that he gave. You surrender your life to him. Ask him to be your Lord and Savior. And the Bible says, promises that we'll do it. He's coming again and he's bringing his kingdom with him. Guys, thank you for joining us today. We hope it's been encouraging to you. Listen, if you made a decision today to follow Jesus, if you decided to make him your savior today, we would love to celebrate that decision with you. Please do us a favor, text the word Jesus to 855-734-7223. If you'd like just more information about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, go to visitgracechurch.com slash next step. Guys, we love you. Remember, more importantly than that, Jesus loves you, and he wants you to live outward focused this week. A staring to the darkness, skeptical inside, making promises we both know our lies, but there's no need for pride when surrender wins the fight. With victory in my bones, I'll be singing till morning comes. My heart can find its courage, cause I know even when the night comes, I'm not scared. Cause even when the night comes, I know you'll be there. Cause even when the night comes, my heart fails. I know, I know you'll always be there. Even when the night comes Your love is higher Your love is stronger Your love is greater So what do I have to fear?